Wine Stories, a podcast to discover the world of wine by Etienne Pommier. A few years ago, the prestigious Master of Wine exam asked candidates the following question. If you had the chance to preserve a grape variety for humanity, which would you choose to save and why? This original question triggered numerous creative responses with students arguing about the merits of their favorite varieties and their capacity to adapt to various soils and climates. Others chose to focus on other cultivars' ability to mutate, like Pinot Noir, in order to obtain more varieties in the future. And one paper even discussed Gouet Blanc, an ancient grape that proved to be the parent of many modern-day varieties. If I had to pick one, I would probably choose Riesling. I am fond of white wines and I never cease to be impressed by the greatness of Burgundy Chardonnay, the vibrancy of Great Sauvignon Blanc or the finesse of Chenin. But the one grape that really fascinates me is Riesling. In France, it is only planted in Alsace, where growers successfully make it in a variety of styles from dry to decidedly sweet. Zinunbrecht, Credenweiss, Ostertag, or Trimbach, are some of the many houses producing fine wines with it. But Riesling's homeland is Germany. The first mention of Riesling dates back to 1435, and it slowly spreads across Germany in the following centuries, especially after the replanting of the famous Schloss Johannesburg in the Rheingau in 1720. In 1787, Trier's mayor, Clemens Wenceslaus, decides that all poor vines ought to be replaced by Riesling. And from that moment on, the Mosul will become, alongside the Rheingo Nahe Pfalz, the cradle of Riesling production in Germany. Nowadays, it is planted across the whole country and it is the flagship of German production. Perfume, delicate and versatile, Riesling is a formidable vector of expression for terroir capable of producing crisp and dry whites, as well as refined sweet wines and even great bubbles. So today, I take you to Germany to talk about Riesling and one of its most prestigious producers, whose name sounds as magical and fascinating to wine lovers as Petrus or Romane Conti, Egon Müller. Seventeen ninety four. It's been two years that revolutionary France has been at war with the first coalition led by Austria, Prussia, and the British Empire, who want to re-establish monarchy in France and prevent republican ideas from spreading across the whole continent. Robespierre is still running the country, and the armies of the French Republic are fighting on all fronts, including in the north and in the east. In the summer, The French regiments advance in the Mosul and General Moreau enters in Trier on August 9th before heading north towards Koblenz. The whole left bank of the Rhine River is now French and the revolution leaders will make these conquered territories part of the new republic. Trier and its surroundings become the Tsar department in 1797 and the area will remain French until the downfall of Napoleon's empire in 1814. As in the rest of the country, the revolutionaries nationalized all of the church's properties and in 1797, they auctioned the possessions of the St. Mary at Martyrs Abbey in Trier, including a vineyard on the Schardsberg Hill to one Jean-Jacques Cor. Cor builds his own winery at the foot of the hill that will become the Schartz of Berg in the village of Wiltingen. After Napoleon's abdication, the Tsar will become German again, and with it, the Cor estate. But, for the anecdote, Germany's most famous winery was originally founded in France. The Schatz of Berg's 20 hectares will be split between Cor's children and one of his daughters will marry a Müller and give birth to a son named Egon Müller I. Since then, All the firstborn sons of the family 
have been named Egon, and the winery is now run by Egon IV. Throughout the 19th century, German viticulture is praised, and its wines are regarded as highly as those of Bordeaux or Burgundy. In his memoirs, Souvenir Culinaire, iconic French chef Auguste Escoffier narrates the preparation of countless menus for prestigious dinners featuring German Rieslings. Over time, and thanks to the development of the railway in the second half of the 19th century, the exceptional quality of the Schatzofberg's wines will make the winery a leading producer. And in 1900, Egon Muller wins the Grand Prix in Paris at the 1900 Universal Exhibition for his famed Clos of the Schatzofberg. Deeply affected by the harsh economic crisis hitting the Weimar Republic in the 1920s, Mosul vineyards will bounce back after World War II and its wines will remain highly sought after on export markets. In the 1950s, the famous Dorchester Hotel in London sells the 1949 Schloss Johannesburg at the same price as Aubryon 47. After a tough time in the 70s and the 80s due to the disastrous effects of the infamous 1971 wine law, German wine regions eventually regained their place amongst the world's greatest wine areas in the late 1990s. For all these years, Egon Muller has remained a leading light, completely committed to the production of high-end wines from the Schatzofberg. It is now widely considered one of Germany's most prestigious domains, and its bottles sell for prices as high as the finest Burgundy wines. Every year, in September, a major wine auction that attracts buyers from all over the world takes place in Trier, the Grosser Ring. Mosel producers keep their finest lots for the auction, and it is the one and only occasion for merchants and collectors alike to acquire some of the region's most exclusive bottlings. In the 2023 sale, the record was set by a magnum of Egon Muller Birenau Schleser 2015, with a whopping hammer price of 16,000 euros. In the world of wine, this kind of stratospheric price tag is only ever achieved by a handful of legendary producers. And in order for you to understand what makes Egon Muller wine so great, I need to start by explaining briefly the German wine classification. There is a fundamental difference in the German classification between dry wines and those with varying degrees of sweetness that fall under the Predikatswein category. While dry whites are now highly sought after, historically, the wines that have made Germany's reputation are the Predikat wines. The category is divided in six classes based on the sugar concentration in the berries at harvest time. But it is essential to understand that the balance of these wines, and especially the sensation of sweetness they provide, is very different from that of most other sweet wines, for two main reasons. The first one comes from the cold German climate that allows Riesling to ripen and concentrate sugar and acids, but often stops alcoholic fermentations early. Since yeast transforms sugars into alcohol, a shorter fermentation means a lower alcohol percentage and a higher level of residual sugar in the wine, which is why most Predicat wines only ever have between 6 and 11% ABV. The second reason derives from Riesling's naturally high acidity that plays a key role in the wine's balance and the sense of sweetness perceived by the taster. As a comparison, a late harvest wine with 60 or to 70 grams per liter residual sugar will typically come off as decidedly sweet, whereas the same concentration in German Riesling will usually give an impression of light to medium sweetness at most. The first class of Predicat wines is the Cabinet, historically a reserve wine cellared for its superior concentration. Cabinets typically have around 25 grams per liter of residual sugar for 11% alcohol and offer a light, off-dry style 
comparable to a Vouvray de Misec. These wines come from ideally ripe grapes, offering fruity varietal flavors of citrus, lime and orchard fruit like peach or pear. The second class is Spätlese, or late harvest, coming from grapes picked overripe with a higher sugar content and a final balance typically around 70 grams per liter of residual sugar and 9 to 10% ABV. The aromatic profile of Spätlese is usually along the same lines of that of the cabinet, but with a sweeter profile due to the higher maturity of the berries. Lemon curd rather than fresh lemon, pear or peach jam rather than crunchy fruit. Then you have the Auslese, or selection, which ideally comes from only overripe grapes affected by what we call the noble rot, botrytis. Botrytis cinerea is a fungus that may develop on all fruits when the weather is humid. In normal condition, botrytis is a plague that can destroy entire crops. But under certain conditions of humidity, warmth and exposure to sunshine, it can transform the harvest into something unique. These conditions are met in a few regions with typically mild autumns and located next to a body of water, such as a lake, as in Neusiedlerse in Austria, or a river, like the Siron in Sauterne, the Bodrog in Tokai, or the Mosel in Germany. Morning mists favor the development of the fungus, but the midday sun stops the process by drying the berries, and the longer these conditions last, the more botrytis concentrates sugars and acids in the berries, as much as it transforms their aromatic profile. German Auslesen offer notes of candied citrus, grapefruit, mango, acacia honey or quince paste. Their concentration is typically around 120 grams per liter of residual sugar, comparable to a sauterne, but with a much higher acidity and a lower alcohol content of 8 to 9%. In rare, exceptional years, the conditions are so favorable for the development of botrytis that the concentration process can last for weeks, yielding wines with a residual sugar content that can reach up to 300 grams per liter. These wines are called Birenhauslese and Trocken Birenhauslese for wines coming from even drier and richer berries. At such high levels of sweetness and acidity, yeasts can barely survive in the must, and the alcoholic fermentation can last several years to achieve only 5 or 6% ABV. Egon Muller's 1976 Trockenbier on or TBA, fermented for more than three years in glass demi Jones before bottling. And the 2015 Birenhaus Leather was the one that set the three auction record in 2023 for 16,000 euros. Finally, the last and rarest class is called ice wine or ice wine. To produce ice wine, the overripe berries left on the vines for weeks must be picked at temperatures below minus 10 degrees Celsius and immediately pressed. The water in the berries being frozen solid, it remains in the press so as to yield a juice as concentrated as a Birenhaus leather but with no botrytis flavor profile. For several years, I have had the privilege of distributing Egon Muller wines in Hong Kong for the company One Red Dot, which gave me the opportunity to try the different wines of the domain in different vintages. What sets Egon Muller apart from the rest of the Mosel for me, and what explains, to a degree, the otherworldly prices of his bottles, count at a bare minimum 100 euros for any vintage of cabinet, is the exceptional purity of the Schatz of Berg wines. The historical part of the Grand Cru, Grosse Lage in the German VDP classification, is a 20 hectare hillside of weathered schist with a steep gradient of about 40% between the bottom of the slope at 190 meters above sea level to the top at 310 meters. The ideal exposure and drainage conditions of the Grand Cru 
combined with the proximity of the Zar River bringing the humidity required for Botrytis development, make it the perfect Riesling vineyard to produce all nuances of predicate wines. Schatzhofberg wines always reveal a mind-boggling aromatic complexity and finesse. The balance between sweetness and tension provided by a zesty acid chisels ethereal and subtle wines, deceptively light yet extraordinarily long-lasting, especially the sweet wines. A handful of centenary-old ungrafted vines in the heart of the vineyard even produce an Altereben cabinet, Altereben means old vines, as well as an Auslese sealed with a golden capsule, both absolutely marvelous wines reserved exclusively for the Grossering auction in Trier. On a more personal note, I have a special bond with Egon Muller wines since my wife and I served the cabinet at our wedding. In order to give you an idea of what Egon Muller wines are about, I have chosen to recount two tasting experiences that have been authentic milestones in my career as a professional wine taster. The first one brings us back 15 years ago, during a dinner I had organized at the Grand Lisboa Hotel in Macau. Macau is the Las Vegas of Asia, and the Grand Lisboa is the most old-fashioned yet iconic casino hotel in the city, with two three Michelin star tables, including the Chinese restaurant The Eight. Back then, the hotel was run by Alan Ho, nephew of Chinese billionaire and gaming tycoon Stanley Ho. Alan Ho had a passion for gastronomy and fine wines, and the hotel featured an impressive list of Egon Muller wines. Ho himself had supervised the pairing menu for the dinner. My wife was supposed to join me, but at the last minute, she could not make it, so a friend of mine, Daniel Schneerzen, joined me on the quick one-hour boat trip to Macau from Hong Kong to attend this exceptional dinner. Riesling is often said to be the most versatile wine of all, capable of pairing with almost any course, and on that night, we experienced the most convincing demonstration imaginable. A 2004 cabinet, sharp and saline, served with Cantonese-style razor clams. A 99 house leather with honeyed and exotic tones and a subtle sweetness to go with the Peking duck. Or an 89 spet leather pairing perfectly with cubes of spiced wagyu beef. This memorable dinner remains, to this day, the most accomplished wine pairing menu I have ever tasted. The second experience I wish to share with you is a tasting of the unrivaled and most highly sought after wine made by Egon Muller, the Trockenbierenhaus Lese, or TBA, made only with highly botrytized and dried berries. Egon II produced the first vintage of this wine in 1959, and I had the privilege of tasting the 1975 vintage with the master himself. Here are my notes from this once-in-a-lifetime tasting. What an incredible color! Dark amber in the center, the wine displays a unique gradation of golds and yellows up to the rim that is literally apple green. The nose first opens up on aromas of acacia honey, coffee bean and sultanas, but slowly reveals layers of caramelized apples and quince. On the palate, the first impression is an extraordinary richness due to the ridiculously high sugar concentration in the wine, between 3 and 400 grams per liter probably, but even Egon himself could not assert the exact number. However, the sweetness is immediately balanced by a surreal level of acidity that holds the wine on a tightrope, perfectly balanced. Absolutely magnificent, this satin of a wine lingers on the palate in a never-ending finish on notes of orange peel. Sublime and nearly perfect. Egon Muller wines are not easy to find, and the growing fame of the domain on overseas markets, and especially in Asia, fuels a strong demand 
pushing prices higher and higher every year. However, if you want to sample the domain's production without spending too much, why not consider the Chartres of Cuvée, blending the young vines of the Grand Cru with the domain's other plots and which offers a cabinet-like balance even if less complex and intense. You can also look for the wines of Egon Muller's other property in Wiltingen, Le Galais, purchased in 1953 and proposing under a different label wines from the Wiltingen Braune Coupe vineyard. But another opportunity to taste the master's style and approach is to look for the Chateau Bella Riesling from Slovakia, a 20-year-old joint project between Egon Muller and local vintner Miroslav Petresh. Stylistically close to a cabinet, it is a delicious drink that sells for only a fraction of the price of the Schatz of Berg's wines. Finally, Egon Muller also works in the Adelaide Hills in Australia with winemaker Michael Andrew Water from East End Cellars to produce the Kenta Dry Riesling. But this wine is virtually impossible to find outside of Australasia and the UK. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation of Egon Muller Wines. Please don't hesitate to leave me a comment or like this episode in your favorite app and see you next week for another wine story. Thank you.